What has America become by 1900 in regard to the world and economic development? The greatest industrial power in the world. How do we get there? All these transformations during the 19th century. One of the things that causes this great economic revolution of 1820-1840 was called the market revolution. The market revolution is where people are not involved in home domestic activities and making most of what they need. Remember Jefferson had this vision of an America based on yeoman farmers and they made almost everything they needed. Interacted very little with the marketplace. And the way they got things from the marketplace was to grow pigs and walk them to the market or distill corn into whiskey and, and travel and buy things they needed like salt and metal works and books and lanterns. But as the 1820s to the 1840, we find more and more people involved in the market. Farmers are growing crops to sell to the market to get an income and they're buying a great number of things for their life and they're less self-reliant because in one case they've got money to buy things whereas yeoman farmers didn't have because they lacked that interaction in the marketplace they were mostly independent so the marketplace is going to grow dramatically one of the things we look at here in trying to account for it is simply the growth of the American population we have lots of consumers and lots of producers. Our population rate in that 50 year period goes from 4 million to 17 million. That's dramatic growth for America. Uh, and we have a very high birth rate. We don't have good information, statistical information on uh, populations other than white women, but we see that that's a very high rate of birth to have six children. We have some different graphic trends that are beginning to emerge. This is what America looked like as far as concentration of populations in 1890 and now we see the populations greatly increasing along here in the northeast and then out here in the west but you're seeing that the that that kind of growth is not taking place in the south which is does retain more of that yeoman farmer tradition and most of the economy of the south at least for the marketplace will be based on slave labor and the plantation system so that's a significant, you can see the, the growing changes between the north and the south. That's going to create some problems as we go along, as you can imagine. All right, your, the first idea that I wanted to give you and have you think about is a, a dramatic change in our transportation system. This is, a, a, this is really what's behind the revolution. We are going to create a way to get directly from the northeast with this high population density and the midwest with its great agricultural potential. This becomes a breadbasket of America. Anybody driven through Illinois and in Indiana? What do you see everywhere? Corn, <laughs> absolutely. You know, 12 foot high corn everywhere or soybeans. And this becomes, and, and then if you go further north, you're gonna find wheat fields up here. You'll find wheat over here in the, the plain states like Nebraska and Kansas. This becomes a breadbasket not only of America, but then ultimately of the world. Now, the great development is the realization that we can use water transportation directly to there. The problem, of course, is those Appalachian Mountains. Right? You look at that range there, it's very difficult to cross over them and get to that Midwest area. As we begin to move there in the early 1800s, we use the Mississippi River, right? We float barges down to New Orleans, put products in warehouses, factors and wholesalers from New England would come down and buy this stuff, transfer it onto ships, that would then bring it around to New England. And that's a fairly, I mean, it was cheaper than trying to move things by wagon across the mountains. That would have been absolutely economically unviable. But this water transportation serves its purpose, but getting back up the Mississippi River is not the easiest thing. And it's a long process. In England, they're building canals. They are, and canals, by the way, are not very deep. They're like four feet deep. 40 feet wide, they put a towpath on each side, and they can simply pull things along with a few horses. But the big question is, can we pull off a canal? Now, if you look at the mountain range again, you can see that break in the Appalachian Mountains. So this break right here is where it's gonna come through. It's the best break in the Appalachian Mountains. It does have a pretty high elevation gain at some points. It's gonna take some really good engineering. What state does this take place in? Do y'all know? Michigan. Which one? Michigan. Uh, it will ultimately start the who, well, I guess I should let you know, it's New York. This is the Erie Canal 
is what puts New York City on the stage for financial mastery of the United States. It's what gives it its prominence in America. Because what happens now, by the way, a governor by the name of Clinton uh, came up with the idea. He sells it to the state up in Albany and he convinces state legislatures that we should put money in this project. We're going to use the <coughs> Hudson River as it flows up here and then at Amsterdam we're going to cross O and Troy. We're going to start, we're going to build a canal that connects to the Erie River and that will get us out to Lake Erie and from the lakes we could have more canals. It's going to cost a lot of money. But he convinces the wealthy people of New York and the rural people of New York that this is a great project. And so it goes forward. At some points it's called Clinton's Great Ditch or Big Ditch. And there was a fair amount of concern that it would ever be viable or it could be pulled off because there are some significant um, elevation gains that have to make it over it. These are called locks. And locks are these gates, basically. Pretty impressive. You open up this gate and the water flows down. You pull your barge and you close the gate behind you. The water is flowing over the top of this and the level raises up. Then you open these doors slowly and you let the water drain out. And so this level is now the same as what's on the other side. Pull the boat through and go back up. This is great engineering on the part of the Americans to pull this off. We've got several places where it has to happen. It's a seven year project, but what it does is it gives direct links in cheap transportation between the East Coast and this great property of the West. And what it does, and this is what I've got written up here, the unintended consequences. Unintended consequences or unforeseen developments is another way you might say this. It is going to render economically unviable farming in New England. I write up there, notification of commercial farming in New England, dislocations in the market, and the implication on families. All right, if you're a New England farmer, how long have Americans been in New England? About 200 years now, right? About 200 years they've been there. And has their population grown? Dramatically. And so this land is being divided up by more and more people. And so what's happening to farming families in 1800 is they got a lot smaller pieces of land than what their grandfathers had. Now, you try to f raise a family on 50 acres in New England, maybe you've been making it a go of it. Maybe you're growing grain and corn and such and being able to get it to New York City. But now that people are moving out to the West, they're getting large tracts of land and they're producing wheat at a much lower rate. Well, they can afford to charge less for it because you've got a family trying to live on 200 acres versus a family living on 40 acres, then you can drop that price of what you get for it. And so the price of wheat and corn drop. And so New England farmers find themselves in a very difficult situation. They cannot, they're going to get such a small amount of money that their lifestyles are going to plummet. You can stay on the farm and have nothing, or you, you can leave the farm. And by the way, your land's not worth very much either. What are your two choices? If you want to keep farming, what are you going to have to do? relocate. And we have the movement of lots of Americans out to the West during this period of time as they realize they want to continue to farm. But that means they've got to break up their social arrangements and sometimes whole families go out there if they're smart enough to leave early and get out there and buy some land before their own land back in New England becomes worthless. But if you've waited too long and you can't afford to get out there anymore, you've got to go looking for work. This is going to, so the Erie Canal is going to dislocate from the market, the ability of farmers, and so it creates a surplus labor for New England because now you've got all these farmers looking for work. And their work is going to be, well, first the construction, some of them get jobs doing the construction of other canals as they form, but ultimately they'll go into the mills, right? In Waltham, Massachusetts, and at Lowell, Massachusetts, as innovating capitalists from New England begin to create factories that look like what they had in England. So that's the that's that interesting thing and and we deal with it today. We we have to pay attention to what has happened in transportation. The development in the 20th century of these container ships are humongous and can bring they so dramatically reduce the cost of transportation that differentials, differences in labor markets are going to move production to those areas. Now your other idea here is the potato famine. This is a great crisis for Ireland. 
The Irish had been dominated by the English. Uh, the final conquest was about 1660 under Oliver Cromwell. The English came in along with Scots from the north. They defeated the Irish tribes. The Irish had to, it was a pretty horrific if you read about it. The, at the end of the day of this several days of battle, actually probably one day of battle, they had a pavilion set up where the Irish remaining Irish chieftains had to come in and sign a capitulation. And they had the heads of their kinsmen lining the way for them to, it was, yes, it was, uh, it was pretty ruthless. And so the Irish chieftains give up all this land to the English who come in and create, take the best land for themselves and large landed estates. And then they move Scots in from the highlands of Scotland to come in and be kind of an occupying security force. And that's how we get ultimately the Scots-Irish because the Scots who've moved there eventually get frustrated with their economic circumstances and they come to America in the 1720s, 1730s, 1740s. Now, 100 years go by, the Irish population has grown dramatically. They live in little villages that are largely hovels. They don't have much land. They don't have, the land they have is very rocky and they have a hard time producing. Also, there's these larger landed estates that are producing and selling most of the products. And so, Irish live on potatoes. They all have a potato patch outside their hut or their cottage. And they've been able to say, sustain themselves on. They're very poor, malnourished people. But what happens in the 1830s is we get a blight on the potatoes. And these potatoes, which are the foundation for nutrition for the Irish, die. And all of a sudden the Irish are starving. And so they take to the boats in any way they can. They're desperate to get out of there. There is shipments coming back and forth from the United States. The United States is selling wheat and corn to England. And these ships on the way back might have manufactured products, but they've got room on these ships and they just start putting people on these ships, whoever can get over here. And there's demand for labor in the United States as we begin to get more urban areas with all kinds of construction projects. And so this leads to a massive flow of desperate people from Ireland. Uh, the response in, in, in New England is an anti-Irish sentiment. Now, wealthy Anglos know they need labor and they want it at a low cost and so they're kind of happy with the Irish coming here. But are there any Anglos in New England who wouldn't like the arrival of the Irish? Who's also having to move from the cities who've been dislocated from their lifestyle? Who are already here? People being dislocated in New England, what? Didn't I say the farmers are being dislocated? They're moving into the cities too? They're looking for work? And they want good wages? What's the problem with the Irish coming? Yeah, these guys are desperate. How much will you work for when you're about to die? <laughs> Anything, right? And if there's a lot of them coming in, so now the Anglos facing an economic difficulty, also you're having to compete with those people for rents in the cities where you're moving to. And so rent prices are going up because there's all this demand. And so rent's going up, wages are falling. This leaves pretty, people pretty desperate. Now there's already a background for anti-Irish sentiment among the English. I think this is built into the fact that the English have to decimate the Irish in order to take their land from them. And how do you feel about yourself when you mistreat another group? Can you feel very good about yourself? You feel very good Christian when you're subjecting to what we what humans almost always do is they dehumanize the people that they have to take things from. And so the English would draw the Irish as orc-like figures and goblins and that they were... Um, a nasty, dangerous people. Here is Florence Nightingale versus Bridget McWhatever there. <laughs> what is it? Bridget McBruiser? And so the whole anti-Irish sentiment explodes into a political movement. How, what do the Anglos want to do in America who are competing for jobs? What do they want to do with want regard to the Irish? What? They want to support it because that means... They want to support the Anglo workers. And what do they want to do about the Irish coming? They don't want them to come. They don't want them to get the jobs that they're looking for. So they want restrictions. Oh, by the way, there's also an anti-Catholic tradition in England, which we're able to pick up on too. 